for these kinds of uh, cliffs and slopes, these kind of boundaries, you think, well, that's okay, we can build them in in some way using uh, dummies or whatever it might be, and we know where they are. And of course, you know, something like Belfast, you probably do know where they are because we can make it pretty clear where they are. But there are other processes that are far less obvious, far less visible, than <coughs> invisible uh, boundaries at work. There's a, a really nice project by some colleagues in my department, uh, Keith Contray and others, Look, they're talking to um, residents, I think of the, of, the, of the private areas in Glasgow and other cities, and particularly gang members and young people, and asking them to, to describe their neighbourhood, the boundaries of their neighbourhood, and asking them to draw a map of that, of that territory. What became apparent from that piece of work is how clear and how distinct those boundaries were in the minds of those people. That there'll be a particular uh, uh, road that if you cross over, you're in a different territory and your life's at risk because you're not from that, that neighbourhood. But as somebody uninitiated, if someone like me walking around that area, you would have no idea where that boundary lay. So in social network space, they're very clear cliffs and boundaries, but we can't see them uh, easily as social researchers unless you were willing to spend months working on the ground at a very micro area, which uh, I guess most of us as, as quants and people don't think we want to do. But it raises, I think, a really profound question because these unseen social processes could potentially feed through into cliffs and slopes in <coughs> economic variables, economic forces. There's a very crude illustration. This is a, a constant quality house price map for Glasgow, a small part of Glasgow. And it is supposedly controlling for variation in house type. And it, so what it's trying to isolate is the, <coughs> the, the, the value that people place at, for different points in space. And what, uh, what really stands out for me in this is these precipitous slopes and, uh, uh, between certain uh, neighbourhoods. I, I, did, I honestly did not know where those neighbors were these. Like, I haven't rigged this in any way. I just used a very flexible functional form to, to plot it. Um, so I, I think it's it's at least kind of um, prima facie evidence that there may be some stuff that we're missing if we're assuming a nice, simple, uh, symmetrical distance game. Let's give you a, 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 an illustration of how you might apply this in practice. Suppose you're interested, as, uh, as uh, I have been in the past, in trying to model the impact on house prices of, of flood risk or of, of a particular flood. Let's suppose you've got two dwellings, A and B, that are, that are at the same uh, distance from some flood boundary, this dark area. That might actually be an actual flood or you might, it might be a, a particular uh, flood risk, you know, a flood plain type of idea. So they're the same distance. So in your symmetrical distance decay type idea, the, the effect of that distance of the flood boundary on A should be exactly the same as B. However, if A is in a different neighborhood or different housing submarket to B, then because that flood occurs in, in this submarket, it may have a much smaller effect on A. <coughs> Why is that? Because people perceive, people who are in this submarket here perceive that flood to be in a different place, in a different neighborhood. It doesn't affect us, it affects people who live in this area. In actual fact, they both have equal uh, risk. So those are how information is distributed within the economy, between households, etc., is partly about these social networks. Well, that's all very good, but if we have no way of, of Detecting those unseen boundaries, how, you know, what do we do with it? What do we do with that other than adopt a council of despair? Well, one, one idea we've been playing with is to, this idea of using uh, <coughs> substitutability. The degree to which two dwellings are perceived to be substitutable and using cross price elasticity to try and estimate that. So the basic idea is that. You know, if, for example, if butter and margarine are close substitutes, if the, if the um, <clears throat> price of butter goes up, that will cause people to switch their demand from butter to margarine, which is a close substitute. That increasing demand for margarine will cause the price of margarine to go up. And 
And so if two goods are, are close substitutes, then you'd expect their, price, their prices to move uh, together. And that basic idea um, from which we then measure cross price elasticity between lots of pairs of dwellings. So if you've got 10,000 dwellings, you go on to estimate 100 million uh, cross price elasticity. Once you've done that, um, you then try and group dwellings together that have a high cross price elasticity. The idea being that if you have two dwellings that are, that are high substitutes, it's not just the similarity of their characteristics, physical characteristics that make them cross substitutes. Well, to some extent, it may be the racial, social uh, makeup of those areas um, that drive as well. So that's what we've done. This map here just shows a clustering into a number of groups of, of uh, properties that have high substitutes. The market perceives them to be very similar types of dwellings. But if that's true, you could use that to define and, uh, these, uh, these borders, these unseen uh, borders. So I think asymmetry is important in terms of in terms of trying to capture these spatial effects. But I think asymmetry is potentially important in uh, a different way. When uh, my, my, my kind of fatherly advice to my son is, when given the choice, always choose fat chips rather than long thin chips. And that's because fat chips have a smaller surface area than long thin chips for a given volume of potato and so they absorb less fat and uh, are healthier. <laughs> Shape matters in the world of chips and I'm proposing or we're proposing that shape might also matter in the world of, of neighbourhoods and, and in the measurement of segregation. Why is that? Well, an early, uh, not long-lived uh, strand in the urban economics literature talked about this minimum border length hypothesis. And this hypothesis went something like this. It, it said if you've got two groups, or two or more groups in society that really are averse to living next door to each other, the context was blacks and whites in America then nobody wants to live at the boundary between black and white neighbourhoods. And as a result, there'll be forces at work to minimise border length, because nobody wants to live at the border. And so what you end up with is neighbourhoods that have nice convex shapes, nice compact shapes, minimise border length relative to the area. On the other hand, if you have people in society that are willing to live at the boundary, plenty of people willing to live at the boundary between the two groups, then you have all sorts of wonderful exotic shapes that could occur because there isn't that strong force to minimise border lengths. You can get non-convex shapes or granular and fragmented shapes. And so that, that raises an interesting question of whether the shape of neighbourhoods, the extent to which they, they look like that, and the extent to which they look like that or that, tells you something about the degree of segregation or the type of, of segregation this. So we're starting to, to try and look at, at uh, uh, trying to base segregation measures not just um, on whether you have a different distribution of groups, but actually try and look at the shape 